Hey everyone, and welcome back. I'm Barb. And I'm Matthew. And today we're going to talk about Season 2, Episode 5 of Psych. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. Uh, before we get started, we definitely want to give a shout out to the official Psych fanatics of our Facebook uh, of the Facebook group, and also to the our new listeners from Reddit. Thank you guys for uh, checking us out, sharing, listening. Uh, we appreciate you guys giving us time. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, we also want to give another shout out to a new fan email. Um, or actually, it's a it's actually Glenn. Um, he's emailed in a couple times Glenn. throughout our show. Um, and Yay. yeah, we just want to go over his email. This one, I think, yeah, this one is in response to episode three of season two, the Psy versus Psy. Um, uh, so it is a week behind Ooh. us. Okay. He still has some interesting things to say. So uh, here he goes. I think the best description is missed opportunities. Having a having a rival fake psychic could have done great things for the show that they sort of explored with. I don't know, E L W E S. I'm not sure who he was referring to there, but um, he later also mentioned... later in the show when Jules, um, um, the rich guy. That's. I don't think that's his name. Maybe no, that not, no, he I had a really dumb be... name. <laughs> I know, but I think that might be who he's talking about. Like that's the only other one that I can. That's true. Maybe, yeah, yeah. That that that's that's actually, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's probably what it was. But um, yeah. So he mentions him as well as the Yin Yang Killer, and he thought that it would be cool if they went more into if they had a rival psychic character like that, but used it in a much different way. He apparently was not a huge fan of how they played with the the guest star and that character having her as the rival psychic. Uh, he does go on to say, "I do think that Lindsay was genuine." genuinely attracted to Sean because I can't really think of any benefit mm -hmm. to her faking the attraction. She didn't get anything from him and could have gone through official channel skit case info anyways. And I 100% agree with Glenn. You and I got into it last time about this because yeah, I, don't I agree. Don't... What does she have to gain from it's faking like sleeping with Sean? She has it's nothing to gain. She well, just liked it's, him. It's not necessarily about gaining anything i think it was more about trying to throw him off like trying to stay well maybe it was about gaining because it was kind of like trying to stay in his world very closely so that she knew what he was up to like i i really feel like she knew that he was smart and was gonna figure it out if she didn't kind of stay on top of it like she i didn't have I really to sleep think with that, him like she didn't oh, even yeah. work him over past that. After that, they, she was actually distant. She didn't talk to him at all. I don't see it, but mm. if you know, if you and Glenn do, I mean, good on you. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I I know we typically don't disagree so much about that sort of thing, but like, I really just didn't get that from her. I don't know. I didn't mm. like her character at all, and and really, that could be what's like fading into that for me is that I really just did not like her character. That's possible. Yeah, I, I guess maybe, but yeah. let's see here. He does also mention um, that Henry was absolutely working, uh, absolutely working Sean to not quit with his "it's okay to quit" speech. Uh, sure. I think that was another thing you and I got into about it. How we, I don't know how it was kind of a, I don't know, mean and aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also, yeah, he thinks. I think he sides a little bit Sean. more with you on that one, where uh, he tries to just change the direction with Sean sometimes if he sees it going in one direction. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Uh, yeah, so he jumped in on our argument, so I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, messaging in, Glenn, and letting us know. Um, but, yeah, and definitely, and he also mentioned on there, because it, it was a bit of a long email, not a problem at all. We love hearing what fans have to say, and like their, their opinions on different sides of arguments, especially whenever we get into debates about stuff like that. So yes, yep, because it's no nice when and and look at how Glenn leaned toward what you thought on one point mm -hmm. and what I thought on another. But mm -hmm. this is the beauty of doing this is that we can like figure out where. Be, I mean, it's just fun to talk about. So I'm glad you're writing into us, Glenn. Thank you. I'm also seeing a lot of that on Reddit too. Uh, when people okay. respond to like uh, questions about like trivia questions or whatever, anytime mm -hmm. we post that or if we post new fan episodes, uh, sometimes uh, they do have interesting 
comments on that there too. So yeah, thanks for messaging in. Um, but okay. now let's get into the stats for this week's episode. Uh, what do we got? Okay. So this episode is titled, And Down the Stretch Comes Murder. It aired originally on August 10th, 2007. It was written by Steve Franks, Josh Bysol, and Andy Berman, and directed by Michael Zinberg. Now, Steve and Andy, we are already very familiar with. We know about them. Let's talk about Josh Bysol this week. Um, he's a producer and a writer. He wrote on shows like Veronica's Closet, American Dad, Scrubs, The Mindy Project, and four episodes of Psych. And he also co-produced 16 episodes of the show. He is a producer on a lot of other shows as well. So he, like the other shows that he wrote on scrubs and Veronica's closet and Mindy project and that sort of thing. He also produced on those shows as well. So um, he's got quite a, quite a resume really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of similar with Michael Zinberg. Um, he's the director for the episode and he has 99 IMDB credits, which every time this happens, bums me out. Just one more job. Mm -hmm. anything really just anything he's probably working on it right okay. now even 100 is all i asked for but um he is responsible okay, for Mike. several hits such as ncis um evil which i actually just watched with the wife and i really enjoyed that um he did a, he did an interesting episode of that as well but um young sheldon the good wife agents of shield and blacklist um, it should also be mentioned that he's done three episodes of Psych in total, um, all the ones that we viewed, including From Earth to Starbucks and Speak Now or Forever Hold Your Peace, which were both well-reviewed episodes with us. Mm -hmm. uh, Speak yeah. Now, I think, was a three-star, and then I think uh, From Earth to Starbucks was a four and a five from you and me. We so, loved From Earth to yeah. Starbucks, yeah. So we approve Ooh, his episodes. Good Wife. He worked on The Good Wife. That was a great show. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So, so Matt, why don't you give us this week's synopsis? Right. So this week, uh, the guys get a call from their grade school bully, Jimmy Nichols, who needs some help. Uh, Sean feels guilty about something that happened in the past and takes the case against Gus's wishes. During the investigation, someone dies and the case gets real while Sean is trying to absolve himself of past wrongdoings against Jimmy. Okay. All right. All right. So let's dive right in now. What, how did we start this one off? All right. So as usual, we have our young Sean and Gus uh, flashback scene. Um, we have Sean and Gus with a bunch of other kids running down the street and into the school. And everybody kind of breaks and goes in a different direction. And they go and hide. Uh, we then get our introduction to Jimmy Nichols. Here is played by Alberto... Geisy, Geisy, um, who is easy to hate in this episode, just with the way that I don't know, just the way he he looks and he acts, it, it all just forms into this like awful person. Uh, but he is very clearly a school bully, and he takes their lunch money, and he, while he's uh, you know, giving them crap, Gus corrects his grammar and then panics and goes into like turtle mode and like hides, and Sean reluctantly gives up his school money. Uh, oh, they yeah, do also like... point out here the the shoes that, that Sean's wearing. Oh, we're going to talk about those shoes later. Uh, good, because um, I know nothing about them, but I figured oh, you might. Oh, I do. It I looks do. like a fad thing. So It was insane. Mm -hmm. It was insane. We'll talk about it, though. I love at the end of this scene when Sean says, one day they're going to stand up to Jimmy Nicholas. And Gus says, I think I'll stay home sick that day. <laughs> He was like, I'm not having that. I'm not doing it. No. That was cute. I could definitely see Gus in this situation. Um, even mm -hmm. the way that he's it, it, he goes about it in current times, uh, I think is interesting, his whole behavior. Like it's very very in character. I love it. That's why I love this young Gus so much. But I yeah. I will say, um they go to the next scene, the they're in the psych office. And why were they wearing, I'm serious when I say, it, look, it was like they were wearing the same outfits as they had on as kids. <laughs> and I know this, to be honest with you, is not something that I noticed so much when the show was 
on years ago. Like I didn't pay much attention. It was oh, yeah. always about the case. It was about this. I am noticing that all the time they're doing that now with young Sean and Gus. And then they show them in like the same outfit as an, as an adult when they got, it's so cute. Really that's, love it. That's actually mm-hmm. a great point. I didn't notice that, especially Sean's Sean's in this one huh? is literally like a carbon. It's copy identical. Of the shirt. It's identical. Yep. Gus's is almost there. It's just two different mm-hmm. colors of blue on the shirt, but yeah. it's still a blue striped button down shirt with khakis. And so it, it's, it's just, oh gosh. So it was perfect. Yeah, Yay wardrobe cool little department. Thing to, to notice. I didn't yeah. see that. Mm. Yeah. It just, for continuity, it's perfect. It would really nice. Really well, nice. we're a minute and 20 seconds in. And Sean tells Gus that he has troubling news. And Gus mm-hmm. assumes that you forgot to TiVo America's Next Top Model. Why and, can't you uh, just use the season pass, Sean? <laughs> inter- yeah, interesting way to, to, to reference it. Um, yeah. Also, TiVo. That's a, that's a callback. Um, they are panicking because Jimmy Nichols called and is coming by to see them in five minutes. And they have no idea what he's like now, why he's coming by, and they are freaked out. Now, Gus goes into, like, extreme ma- extreme panic mode here. Yes. He starts breathing heavy. He is, like, looking at the door, locking it. He, he said, wants to print out he a... He said, I'll print, the, <laughs> I'll print the foreclosure sign. And, put, and then scrape the decal off the window. And Sean is worried about getting a squirrely as a grown man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but Sean uh was yeah. very panicky it was it was a lot of panic like it really brought something back in him you could see it was like trauma mm-hmm. as, yeah, yeah and he try he does try to calm gus down though I, I think it's almost in a way to talk himself off the ledge um he tries to mm-hmm. calm gus down and then gus says some people are just born evil the kid from the omen the children from the corn chad michael murray <laughs> where why Chad Michael Murray? <laughs> Chad Michael Murray is like I don't even he's think in I know Hallmark who that is. Movies for crying out loud. He was he was at do you remember the Cinderella movie with um with Hillary Duff? Cinderella uh, oh, story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the oh, football player. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Him. Chad Michael Murray. He was in like Gilmore Girls and One Tree Hill and like he, he was definitely I don't know where the evil came from there. I, I don't know. Maybe they know something we don't, but yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But uh then yeah. one second later, in like a complete twist, uh Gus notices that there are lockers in the psych office now and is Did very you? confused. Did and you? he no longer is concerned with Jimmy Nichols. He's uh, he's like, What are those lockers doing there? Sean jumps Did up. Mind? <laughs> Did your mind, as soon as you saw that he bought lockers, go to, like, this is the perfect time. Now they can be stuffed into them. Oh, I didn't, but that's a good point. <laughs> like, that's where my mind went as soon as I saw them. Um, I did think that they looked like the lockers in the flashback classroom scene in the later in the episode. Like, it looks like the same little segment. But, um, it may have been. I no, what I, what I was thinking was, uh, it's funny how, how they both go from, like, panic to, like, oh something new shiny like what's this like their attitudes completely changed sean's like Squirrel. oh yeah check this out i got into a bidding war with the montessori school like like and then he opens them up and it has pictures of the characters from miami vice these like glam shots of the two guys from miami vice and gus is like you just had to hit it on the head didn't you i i don't know these characters new well but uh, super well but i do see the the connection of like the two partners it was for stubs and crockett it's crockett and tubs by tubs? the way not, okay i thought it was said not, stubs. not okay. stubs tubs and crockett okay crockett but yeah there's like glamour shots that and are like crockett was don johnson he always always had but i will admit that i kind of missed this and i'm adding it to the 80s references right now because i don't know i don't know what came over me that i didn't add this to the i think it's like such a big part of pop culture that I don't know. I just didn't think about it anyway. Um, Crockett and Tubbs. And they were like these vice cops in Miami, Matt. And it was a big deal for years, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I loved how they just completely changed their tone whenever they like saw some new shiny object. (laughs) Yeah. I, I thought that was good. Jimmy Nichols arrives there 
And I was cracking up at how they filmed this because they open the door and it's like they're doing it from Sean's eye level and they scan like they open the door and they're looking from Sean's perspective and they see nothing but a little bit of hair at the bottom of the screen. And then you look down and there's Jimmy. And the looks on both of their faces was really good. They were both completely shocked Mm -hmm. at how small he was. Yeah, and I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not sure about like that that the difference between the flashback kid and this guy, because the guy doesn't. I don't know. Just he didn't really. He seemed like he was just a small guy. I don't know. I wasn't sure if he was actually know, like, a little I person. I really didn't feel like it matched up. Like, or jockey, the... but I don't think that. I don't. I don't no, think he's that not he... really a little person. He's just short. He's just very very short. And he's like four nine or something like that. I mean, he's just okay. Very... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah, Bruno okay. Mars is not much taller than that. I don't think Bruno Mars is much taller than that. Bruno Mars is very no. I'm serious. Like he's just very short. Mm. So I think I think that you know he's not a little person. But yeah, jockeys are very small people. Yeah. They just yeah. are. But I didn't think when as soon as I saw him, I didn't feel like the kid that they had playing him and him. Matched. No, not at all. Yeah, it was like yeah, yeah. Two different people. Yep, I felt the I same didn't way. Didn't like the continuity of that at all. Well, I think what happened was is they wanted a bully kid, and bullies uh-huh. in school are usually larger, I guess. Uh, you know, the tougher, larger ones, and yeah, then I mean, they like, wanted a small look... guy for this one. So, yeah. I don't know. He just didn't even look like. In they the probably face, couldn't find the best like. of the worlds. I don't but know. Yes. I mean, I'm sure they did the best they could, but it wasn't mm-hmm. great. But uh, yes, yeah, so we were three minutes thirty seconds in. So when whenever he first knocked on the door, uh, Gus was still in panic mode, and inside one of the lockers was like a little mini bat that you would get from like a baseball game. And he grabs the mini bat and he's like holding it, and as he walks up to the door, like ready for anything that happens. And then when Sean opens the door and sees how small the guy is, he like whispers <laughs> over to Gus. He's like, "Good call with the mini bat." <laughs> that kills me. It still kills me. I love that. That was really funny. It was a great little addition. Like, again, who thought of that? Who's like, guys, this is a good scene. What are we going to add to this? What if Gus right. has a mini bat? And then he makes a joke about, like, good call with the mini bat. Uh-huh. Who thought of that? That's crazy. I love that. But, um, that's yeah, so that stood out. The psych writers. Mm-hmm. That, that stood out as a good one for me. Mm-hmm. But essentially, in this scene, Jimmy explains that he is a jockey. And that since he's come to Santa Barbara, there have been some weird things that have been happening. He's been losing a lot of races, mm-hmm. even on horses that he's consistently good on. And he thinks that something weird's going on, and he heard about them, and he wants them to come and check it out and, like, psychically read the horses and, but and, he's like and the mean. track and everything. He's really mean when he's asking them to do it. He's like... Yeah. Calling them names and like he's just like really? Do are you inspiring them to want to help you? I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, we're six minutes in. Jimmy's explained what's going on, and after being rude to them and then asking them for help, they surprisingly do it. Well, Sean does. Well, Sean does. Gus doesn't really want any part of it. Now, we, also in the room when they are when they are talking, <laughs> did you notice that every single time that Jimmy <laughs> turns around, he turns around to look at things, and every yes. time. Gus is like going after him with the bat and Sean has to stop him. <laughs> yes, I noticed that. And then he's holding the bat behind him and it's very obvious that he's holding something behind him, but like nobody's addressing it. <laughs> no. I no and he, he like really wants an opportunity to take this guy. I mean, really, he does. He's like so it, angry still after all these years. Yeah. Yeah. So after Jimmy leaves... Gus and Sean are kind of discussing this because (laughs) Sean signed them up for a case that Gus doesn't want to do, and he's trying to figure out why. And during this whole thing, one of the things we find out is that Gus has been keeping track of all of the lunch money that Jimmy has stolen from him throughout his life. It's very, very Gus. It is, exactly. And then he's also adjusted it for inflation. (laughs) And he's like, it's like $1,800, Sean. And later on, that's part of the stipulation for taking the case officially is that they're going to overcharge him by eighteen hundred dollars. And I thought that was that, mm-hmm. was that was really good. I like that. That was funny. It was true to the character. Definitely want to point those out. But part of the reason, though, that this was interesting is why Sean 
takes the case when he doesn't want to and why he looks so mm-hmm. off about it. And it's because he feels guilty. Uh, when they were kids, there was an incident that they refer to as the spitball incident, which was when they were in class, um, a teacher was hit with the spitball. Nobody knew who it was from, but the teacher fell off a chair or something and got hurt. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy got blamed for it. And because of that incident, he was actually sent to a boarding school. And there was like talks, like nobody actually knows what happened to him. They just know that he well, was they gone thought and they he made up stories and stuff. School. Right, right. Right. Um, but we find out, uh, or Sean admits that he feels guilty because he was the one that ratted him out. I love the note. I love the note. I love the note. The note yes. that he gave to the teacher. So he, Gus is he, like, why would you rat out Jimmy Nichols, Sean? That's, oh, do you have a death wish? And he's like, dude. I was like, we were in the classroom and I was, I was under a lot of pressure. I mm-hmm. chips was on at six and they wouldn't let us leave. And, and <laughs> I, I love that. That's chips. what he, he was under pressure. He was under a yeah. lot of pressure because he didn't want to miss chips. Yeah. Yeah. And which yes. by the way, cop show, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he handed the teacher a note or the principal, a note that said, Jimmy Nichols did it. Your hair looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And the te- so the Sean even knew like, how to manipulate smirked. people at a young age. Yep. <laughs> the teacher smirked like, "Yeah, yes, yeah, great." <laughs> he took the compliment. He definitely oh, did. He, did. And his hair he was loved off. it. I also loved in this scene that when they're talking about all of this, as soon as they are discussing the idea of taking this case, Gus starts lifting weights. Yes, I, I I took note of that too. He's the t- like a ten pound dumbbell, and he starts yeah. curling as if like like him doing this now. He's going to be ready for tomorrow. It's like he's got a he's got to bulk up to take on this mm-hmm. tiny person. He does say that when Jimmy got kicked out of school, it was the best day of his life. He could finally wear underwear <laughs> to school again. <laughs> I love these little looks into their past. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love poor these little, little Gus. He was <laughs> poor little Gus was so traumatized. Yeah, he terrible. had some times. So okay, so after the after the scene there at the office, we go to the track stables, and Sean and Gus are there. Sean is talking to a horse in horse language, and he says <laughs> he says to Jimmy. He doesn't like the oats or the alfalfa pellets. The pellets should be crunchy. <laughs> Jimmy's not buying. <laughs> that was funny to me. Jimmy's not yeah, buying. Yeah, that did not film. hit me the same way. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it was so random. It was, and but yet very specific. Like he was. How was he that specific? I don't know. He's just very creative. I gotta love Sean. I think he was banking on the fact that Jimmy probably doesn't know what the horse is eating exactly, and he sure. was just trying to be psychic with him. Because I mean, if you think about it, this case has there's nothing real about this case yet. Like there's, right. there's nothing that Sean actually has as evidence. He's he mm-hmm. thinks he has to make all this stuff up because it's yeah. just like a, a random no dead body case. Yeah. Well, at this scene or in this scene, Sean also notices a tall blonde woman with a wedding ring on talking to another jockey. And he doesn't really know who it is, but he notices how they touch hands. Mm -hmm. And you could see that there was like an intimate nature to it. And then she leaves. And so that was kind of our first. You you sort of know that that's kind of our first clue uh, Mm -hmm. about like something related to the case. And then they run into none other than Henry at the track there. And Henry is wearing an awful shirt. At, right as Sean is downing the place and being like, who, oh, what kind of loser would hang out here? That's when they see Henry. And the shirt that he is wearing is awful. It yep. is red and it is what printed. And Sean says, tell me you're wearing that shirt because someone has to spot you from space. Yeah, it's one of many awful shirts in this episode. Yeah. They're it was really bad. bad. They're they're that really one, bad. That red one might be the worst one. I don't even know what the print was. That was I don't I can't even know what that was. The first one? Um I, I think I, I, I have a screenshot of that one. It's awful. That one was dogs playing poker. Oh good heavens. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. There was another red one in there that was like a billiards table. 
It's terrible. Yeah, it, it was rough. And then the one in the middle was really bad. But yeah, we'll, mm-hmm. uh, we have comments about those too. Yeah, exactly. One of uh, Henry's friends comes over from the track and Gus his is gets Phil. his nickname, uh, Burton Oil Can Guster, which mm-hmm. is one of our Gus nicknames for the episode. I think he has one more, but I don't really count it as like a Gus nickname. No. It's more of like a brainstorm kind of thing. Just yes. like on the spot. Yeah. I didn't think I didn't really count it. I wasn't sure how you felt about that. But uh yeah, this is our Gus mm-hmm. nickname. And it's it's an okay one. I always love it when he calls him Burton. Um uh-huh. just it's very because... formal. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It's very you forget formal. that that's his name sometimes. So. Right, right. Ten thirty. But with the with his friend Phil. Uh, we find out that, you know, and, and he, he pops up in the episode a couple of times. So we find out that he is a, not really a friend of Henry's. Um, he's a gambler who never knows when to quit. And he has a bit of a hot streak going at the moment where he's mm-hmm. just nailing it. So Henry's kind of listening to him more while he's doing hot. Yeah. I I did like at the end of that scene when um, Phil leaves and Sean says that their shirts his shirt and Phil's shirt to get together should get together and go bowling sometime. Mm-hmm. That's funny to me since they're like bowling shirts. I, now anyway. there was another reference here that I wasn't super familiar with. Oh, I totally was. I got Mr. you. Mr. Furley's closet. Mr. Referencing Furley. Henry's ugly shirt. Who's Absolutely. Mr. Furley. What's this about? Well, Mr. Furley was a character on Three's Company. And he okay, was like the I just landlord, Googled it and I know what it's about. And he is always, always I'm wearing seeing... ugly shirt, ugly shirts, and ugly clothes. Yeah, I'm seeing yeah. these awful shirts. Okay, yeah, I get yeah. it. Mr. Furley was played by Don Knotts, famous comedian. Famous. Okay, he was All from right, the well, Andy Griffith show, Matt. That goes way. That's back. where I know him from. I right. know that. Okay. All right. right. Okay. All right, so uh, in the next scene, we're 11 minutes, 54 seconds in. Right as the race ends, everybody's starting to, like, look away and go back in. The jockey falls off the horse, and everybody starts to crowd around him. And one of the photographers that are close by runs over and starts to give him CPR, but it's pretty clear the guy looks like he's dead. And nobody knows what just happened, because about a second ago, he was just on the horse in the race. So Right. And, yeah. and then, uh, you know, everyone's there. All the police are there, Lassie and Jules and everybody. And I loved how you could see Lassie feeding the horse a carrot, like, really secretively. It was mm-hmm. cute. Yeah. It was very cute. Yeah, and it was weird because at the time I was like, what are they going to do with this? Like, what, what, like, this is a very strange detail to add because I don't recall... Mm-hmm. In future episodes, at least, a lot of like horses and laster and horses coming into play. Like, I thought it was a strange detail to add. I was like, what are they going to do with this? This episode, I don't remember this. I don't, I don't know. I just like it. Like, sometimes they give you pieces of people's past or like things about them, and it sort of builds up whether it stays on that subject or just kind of a piece of who they were. So, yeah. I don't know. I like but uh, yeah, we do get a, one of those from Juliet here as well, where uh, they're talking and Juliet is like clearly uncomfortable around like all the jockeys. And she says that she has a thing with little people that they make her uncomfortable. She dated a Christmas elf at one point in her life and it, they dumped her for a dancer. And now she's like <laughs> bitter about little people, uh, which was very funny and unexpected. And Sean describes it as. She is a question mark wrapped in an enigma. I think that's what it was. Uh, she says uh, she's an enigma a wrapped in a little blonde mark. riddle. Re- yeah. Enig- yeah. Cute. So I thought that was a weird, interesting little piece of like Juliet that we figure out. Mm-hmm. And I, if you also, if you pause it here, um, there's something that. I mean, it doesn't really mean anything at this point, but when you know about what's going on in the rest of the episode, it makes more sense. In this scene, in the background, we have Phil, the guy who's placing bets and stuff, the the bad gambler, in the background, like just out of ear earshot from Sean and Gus. And he's just kind of looking around, you know, uh, like loitering, I guess. And well, they then actually... we also have... Gus, or not Gus, I'm sorry. Uh, they also have the photographer being questioned by Lassiter. Like, what about, like, getting his statement about what happened. 
So, so that's did you two notice people. they also did um, some shots of Phil, like leaning against the fence? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. During the yeah, so, I mean, during the, the CPR scene, we're checking out Phil a little right, bit. Right, but that one point. was obvious. Like that mm-hmm. one, like that was him in the shot. This one mm-hmm. was it was Sean and Gus talking, and he was just in the background there. And I I didn't notice it until I paused it because of something else that was in the scene. I think it might have been something with the shirt or something. But um, and then you also have tall blonde woman back there looking at the body in uh, that's like in the body bag. But um, whenever they go to it, look at the uh, what's his name? Juan's Juan's body. Later, she's behind mm-hmm. them, trying to like peek over to look inside and see. Yeah. So another little she's detail that we find out about a later. Lot in this episode, she's in the background of a lot of scenes. Yeah, I think you can see her red dress stand out pretty well. Gus does also pull out some medical knowledge in the scene, and he brings up some stuff about how the the way that they described like the body being like stiffer makes him think it that it doesn't sound well, like first, it was just last a heart day or issue. somebody said it was a heart attack yeah so right Gus but they is like no that's like no that's caused by like poison something attacking the nervous system mm-hmm. um so they're they're interested and gus shows mm-hmm. off his you know, skills again right you know he's so handy to have around sean then sean, calls him sean dr really... pratt which I'm, I, I believe is an ER reference. It is. Uh, that was played by Mackay Pfeiffer for a t- couple of years on ER from 2002. He was, he was Dr. Pratt. This is, okay. after, this is after Clooney and, you know, Noah Wiley left and everybody. Never saw it. It was more of a house guy, uh, I guess. Okay. I didn't, well, I didn't love it. I mean, I watched a couple seasons of it. It wasn't my favorite show. Mm-hmm. I don't tend to like the medical drama so much other than helps. So, uh, so 14 minutes and one second in Sean and Gus go into the chief's office. Sean, <laughs> Sean says, stop. Everyone acknowledge that the chief is wearing leopard print. <laughs> yeah. It just interrupts everything. <laughs> yes. The chief looks briefly uncomfortable. Yes, and and then Sean goes into like like, but you can see on everyone's face like they're like, okay, yeah, we're acknowledging that it was it was even Lassiter was like, okay, and he nodded a little bit. It was cute <laughs> that he bought into it, you know. And then Sean is trying to let them know, listen, he was poisoned, and I like how before he even like finishes the argument, Lassie's like, he's right. And Sean goes on, now, Lassie, why can't you give me the benefit of the doubt, whatever? And he's agreed with him. And he didn't even hear it because so, so often Lassiter Lassie agreed doesn't with him agree. immediately. Right. And then Sean assumed that he was not going to. So he just started like, right. a, like a, a, I don't know, questioning yeah, him. Like he's fighting him on it. Yeah. Yeah. But he only agrees with him partially. He doesn't think it was necessarily foul play. He thinks it was like a drug overdose because he had a bunch of, uh, different types of like tranquilizers and uh, and uppers in his system so he thinks did it was you hear him he said drug overdose he said he was four foot nine and three feet of that was drugs <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was a good one that was a good it was, one it was good how he described that mm-hmm. but that is our case update so far is that we know that he was poisoned Okay, so Jules... Well, we know that there was lots of drugs in it. Right. They think he was poisoned. Mm -hmm. And Jules asks Sean how he knew... Oh, well, Sean also brings in the fact that he saw that jockey that died, um, that he was... He is telling them that that jockey was having an affair with a married woman. And Jules says, how did you know that? And he says... For the same reason that I know that as a child, Lassie wanted nothing more than a pony. And everyone in the room smirks. And Lassie looks, like, uncomfortable for a second. And then he's like, come on, who didn't? And then Gus jumps in, like, snap, anyone that wasn't an eight-year-old girl? <laughs> so we had our crap on then, Lassie moment. <laughs> and then they get up to leave and Sean holds his arms out and says, Lassie, your childhood must have been pure hell. The good news... I'm available for hugs. <laughs> and Lassie just runs away from him. <laughs> Nobody takes one. No. He's just standing there. Uh, but we're 15 minutes in now. Well, 16 almost. And Sean runs into the psych office jogging. 
which is a very rare one. And no, he I... also has shows Gus that he has uh, rigged the lockers to open by like slapping the side of it, which is a very <laughs> strange detail. Does absolutely nothing. And it's just well, a funny little thing. I think it's like a throwback because you had like on Happy Days, for example, which is probably another show you don't know about, but our listeners will. Happy I know the Days. Theme song. It's really annoying. <laughs> Sunday, Monday, Happy, happy Days. Happy Days. Tuesday, Wednesday, Happy, happy days. days. Thursday, Friday, <laughs> Happy Days. Saturday. Okay. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Anyway. Um, the Fonzie character in that show used to be able to turn the jukebox on by hitting it. So it was oh. like you were cool if you could do I mean there are the ro- there's a lot of a I lot of the things like arms. that. Even yeah. in Friends they do certain things like that. Like you know how Joey can open a shirt just by no, you, know, yeah. you know, I mean it's just kind of a cool thing. Like, you know, you don't have to mm. anyway. Hopefully somebody out there understands what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> well, no, it's just, it definitely see, it's a, it's a completely unnecessary detail that makes sense in context. Like I could definitely see right. Sean being there, like up at four in the morning in the psych office. And he's like, dude, I want to make the thing open just with a slap, like just yeah. bang on the yeah. side and it pops open like mm-hmm. in a movie. Like it's Believable. cool. Mm-hmm. It's just cool. So after his run and after talking about that, he goes back to talking about the spitball incident. And Gus wants him to just leave it alone. Yeah. But he's he's kind of he's kind of stuck on it. He he doesn't want to. He keeps thinking about it. Yeah, Sean is definitely hooked on it. And although at this time Gus doesn't seem weird about it, I don't think. I think he just wants him no. to not waste his time on it. Like it seems yeah. like don't waste your time on that. That that happened like twenty years ago. If you're not gonna, if you didn't figure it out then, you're not gonna figure it out now. I also think he is just wondering why do you keep going back to that? Like mm-hmm. what? Why? Why does it matter at this point? But yeah. Sean just feels but, guilty. Uh, he does also, we do also get this really cool scene about that, though, mm-hmm. where it's like this meta flashback scene where we have, it's in the classroom, and Sean's like remembering all the details and everything that happened, and we have young Sean sitting in front of old Sean, and then they also interact since it's just like his subconscious. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really cool scene. It I never it. happens again, and I thought it was really it. cool. And then I got to thinking about how that is probably the only time in the whole series that Liam got to act with James. Mm-hmm. That they that maybe that's the only time they ever even yes. talked. Right. I mean, like, how cool they is that? They never have like, scenes was... together. We don't know if they ever filmed, like, on the same days or anything. They might right. not ever have talked except for this one scene. Right. And there because they if are, he was, was acting, all crazy. he had to do was watch some of the episodes, like to right. to to copy Sean's mannerisms. He didn't actually mm-hmm. have to have to you know talk to Sean at all. So yeah, right. that's a really interesting thing. Cool. And I never thought about that until I was watching it today. As far as yeah. like in the aspect of you know recording for the yeah. podcast, it was an interesting detail to really think about. Yeah, absolutely. Very. And cool. then he makes Very this like cool funny comment did. about like, "Oh, I thought I'd lose my hair by 20. And he's like, "This changes everything." And like, this is mm-hmm. young Sean who's like having hair is going to change everything. Yeah, because he's looking at his dad, thinking, "Well, yeah. my dad's lost his hair. What <laughs> I mean is it going to happen to me?" And he's as an adult, he's really proud of his hair. It yeah. was a good. It was a good way to uh, to address that i really liked what they did with that scene i really liked that Mm -hmm. but he does deduce that there was a second spitter he remembers that jimmy while he did have a straw in his mouth was drinking from it and it was like filled with liquid at the time he was not the one who fired the spitball Mm -hmm. so now sean has got to figure out who the second spitter was right they're back at the track after that and they're walking and if i'm 100 percent honest with you I couldn't hear exactly what he was talking about. Was something to do with Gus selling something? I, I really don't know what they were talking about. But Sean says, Gus, save it for your podcast. What? Yeah. It was when they first, like, right after this whole scene at the office where they backtrack into the the scene with young and old Sean. And they're walking through the place at the track talking about i don't know what they were talking about they were talking about something to do with like selling merchandise for something and then 
And he says, I'm not going to do that. Oh, it was a, no, no, no. It was about the, uh, the, the teen wolf thing. He's like, if oh. there really was a teen wolf, I can, I can promise you that, uh, we wouldn't be just letting him like be normal because he could dunk a basketball that we certainly wouldn't be selling like I heart wolf merch merchandise. Yeah. So essentially it was him like, right. uh, like reviewing quote unquote, like teen wolf, if it was real. Well, that's the podcast thing. Okay. Yeah. So, but he, I thought it was cool that back then he said, save it for your podcast. That is a good point. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, podcasts weren't too huge. Right no, now, I think. that was like 2007 still. Yeah. They, it was, I mean, there were some, but they weren't like all news or sports related or something back then. It wasn't like, yeah, what it is today, like us doing this. Yeah. It wasn't like that. It, I thought it was a cool reference. Yeah, interesting catch. Interesting catch. I thought it was a cool reference. Yeah. But then Sean runs into Henry and he, he says, Oh my God, the shirt has a brother. <laughs> <laughs> that shirt was hideous. It was awful. It that was just shirt so much had color. It had a thousand colors in it. And it, it had like parrots and like Hawaiian women playing ukuleles. And like, yes. it was, there was just so much. Your eyes couldn't even take it all. It was bad. It was terrible. But uh, they also run into the announcer, who's kind of like a, uh, I don't know, I guess a local figurehead in the building, kind of the way like a, like a sports or like a local anchor people kind mm -hmm. of know who he is. Um, and he has his little catchphrase, the race is on, which is race very is cringe worthy in this episode. Every <laughs> yes. time they see him, they do this whole race is on thing and uh -huh. definitely cringe worthy. But it is important that they, that there are, several things that we get from him. Um, the first thing is that we find out that the track is closing. Um, he says that there's not a lot of people coming anymore. And, you know, that leads to mm -hmm. you know, reasons to close it. And mm -hmm. then Sean comes in. Is it because of his shirt? I'm sorry, but it's like a genocide of color. Like a rainbow is weeping. <laughs> <laughs> he just really is crapping on Henry's shirts. And I kind of liked it because I don't remember if they ever brought it up in season one, like Henry's ugly shirts. And they weren't, I don't think they were super ugly in season one. I think it was more just like we knew it was coming. But I don't know. I just feel like it's always something I noticed. Shirts. It's just always something I noticed about the show is that he well, they always definitely wore... lean into it. Like from this point mm -hmm. on, I think I think that they put him in like sometimes mm -hmm. hideous shirts on a fairly regular basis, just because you know that's a a trait of Henry is yeah. he buys like Costco shirts like for ten bucks each. So <laughs> and, like um, he's getting ready to go on a cruise all the time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> I think it's cool that they really like leaned into it in this one to yeah. kind of establish that thing. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah, Sean really hits hard at the shirts in this episode. Yeah. And then the announcer also tells him, because Gus notices the the woman again. He sees her like at the track again. And he calls the her T B W the tall blonde woman. <laughs> and it's because Sean was using acronyms for other things before. Mm -hmm. But the announcer comes in and he says, Oh, that's Jimmy's wife. Um, yeah, she's around the track all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know, Sean and Gus know what's going on now. They figured out that Jimmy's wife was sleeping with Juan. Juan has also been known to take Jimmy's, uh, like, horses for races. Mm -hmm. And they fought about that. So now they're getting a picture in their head that maybe Jimmy's to blame for this. Like, maybe Jimmy's doing something. So we got a lot of interesting information in that scene and there was actually a funny little one in it where they were talking about it and uh and, and gus is like looks like juan carlos was taking all of jimmy's mounts and then the announcer just kind of like rolled his eyes and walked away <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was funny because gus was on a bit of a roll uh well, we find out soon that Jimmy has been arrested. This is sort of like a continuation of this scene. Jimmy has been arrested for the murder of Juan Carlos. And after he goes into the jail, they were trying to get an interview with him. They wanted to have time with him to talk. 
and they're looking at him through the the mirror window at the at the interrogation room and he's wearing this like orange and white white like his uniform was really bright and sean starts to make references how he looks like a tangelo and and things like that in that in that outfit and gus says (laughs) i think he looks like an evil little creamsicle (laughs) And then they argue about whether it's creamsicle or dreamsicle. Mm-hmm. And yeah, an evil little creamsicle. That was funny to me. <laughs> and uh, for a case update, uh, we find out that Jimmy's been arrested because Juan was taking all of his mounts, and they were arguing about that on on site, on like at the track. Uh, the ketamine that was used in or used to kill Juan was also found in Jimmy's locker, and they. Uh, tell Jimmy that they also know that his wife was cheating on him or having an affair with Juan and Jimmy reacts poorly indicating that he didn't know about that. Right. Which and is he starts to that's dive the driving over... factor here. Yeah. Well he starts to dive over the table. And did you see when the cop that was in there with them <laughs> grabbed him and his feet were completely off the ground and like running? Yeah. And I, I paused it to take a better look at that, and I think they just got a really big cop to make it even more like like amplified about the size differences. Well, it kind of make me made me. Miss, I was wondering where McNabb was because he could have yeah, totally he's done like six, that. Four. He's six four. He was like, I don't know, three feet taller than this dude, and he. I mean, really, he could have done that. Yeah, they they should have brought McNabb in. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. Anyway. I'm just, huh. I in that scene I missed McNabb in that scene. Just saying. Uh McNabb wasn't Oh no, he was in the last one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we we got him in the last one. He was in yeah. the last one, not this one. Yeah, it was just a shorter scene in the last one. But yeah. yes. Uh so yeah, back on discussion here. Uh mm-hmm. so we uh we then go once they've discovered this, um Jimmy also mentions that he noticed in the last race how all the horses uh, slowed down. Well, in the last going races. Around the last... Right, sorry. Yeah, in, mm-hmm. in the last several races. Right. Um, all the horses were, like, slowing down around, like, the last track, or uh, what's it called? The the last uh, stretch. Mm-hmm. And that gets Sean thinking. And he goes back to the actual track, and he's out on the track now, kind of inspecting it, looking to see if anything is standing out, or looking strange that might cause, like, all the horses to slow down at the same time. And while doing this, he gets the idea to like race Gus, like challenge Gus to a race. And but wait, while Gus... he's talking, this is before this is before that. I'm just gonna add like he's challenging him. And while he's doing, did you doing while he's challenging him and Gus is saying no, did you notice that Gus was stretching? <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Yeah, he was standing there like pulling up his like back leg. Yeah. Yeah, he was stretching. But Sean mentions that uh, or so Gus tells him no, and then Sean mentions like, "Oh yeah, I see, I see," because I beat you in like the middle school Olympics. And then Gus mentions that he only lost because he had shin splints, a torn meniscus, and a plantar sport. <laughs> and then he says, "I also had a ruptured patella, but wasn't gonna say anything." <laughs> and to, and then Gus and Sean's like, "I don't believe that, that's that's there's no way that's true." And he's like, "Check with my doctor." Like his doctor is keeping notes on that still. So after <laughs> after they race, which Shin by the way had a photo a finish, meniscus and they, the plantar sport. Yeah, because right then. Gus takes off. He's like, yeah, okay. And then he starts running and they, they race and they, they really tie, essentially. It was like a photo finish. And so then they decide to go to... But they're both dead. They're both just like oh, completely yeah, they're worn like... out from that very <gasps> short race. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so they're trying to figure out where to go. Sean looks up from where they ended their race and they notice the announcer's box. So they go up to the announcer's box and Barry, the announcer, is a little bit less than thrilled to see them. But while they're there, Gus notices a thing called a Chaco, which is an artifact from Native Native Indians. And it's a device that you would use to like blow darts through. And then during that time, also the photographer comes in. So they decide to leave. But yeah. And the photographer looks noticeably like uncomfortable. Yeah. Or I don't know. He he looks a little off. Something suspicious there. Right. 
but we yeah. only get a, a, a minute in there. Yeah. Um, they, uh, Sean also notices in the office uh, a stack of VHS tapes for like the recordings of the race, as well as the dates that are that were like set out, because uh, mm-hmm. there's only a couple of them. And then they head over to Henry's because yes. he has an idea. Yeah. So Sean, you know, whenever he's in a bad place, he or doesn't know where to go with the case, they go to Kent Henry's house. In this case, they go not because he really is stuck, but because they know that Henry is going to have video footage because he tapes the races. Mm-hmm. By the way, when they're in Henry's house, did you notice he has a bowling ball on the mantle? I did. I don't know why it's there. It, there was no plaque or anything. It was just kind of sitting there. So it, it was odd to me. Like there was other sporting stuff up there, and there was a big jar of dice, like a big glass. Uh, yeah, like jar a milk jug thing with like a cork in it. Yeah. Yeah, it was very. It was just a little bit odd, but a bowling ball. It felt very strange to me. Although anyway. I could totally see Henry as the guy down at the lanes that takes it like super seriously. Yeah. And I, uh, is yeah. like challenging other people around, like the other like cops mm-hmm. or whatever around him. I could see that. And, yeah. He would and have then, a bowling nemesis that, that he's constantly trying to beat that like they go head to head all the time. I could totally see that. Yeah. I'm um, well during this time, Sean has asked Henry, Do you have footage of this case and or this uh race? And Sean's, you know, really, really wanting to see that footage. So Henry presents it like, Yeah, I do have this, but if if I'm gonna show it to you, I have a stipulation, and the stipulation is You have to go to the track, to the derby with me, wearing a Henry shirt. Mm -hmm. And that's when you see at 26 minutes, 26 seconds, our Where's the Pineapple moment in the pineapples are on the shirt. It's by far the best shirt out of the bunch. I feel like we've seen this shirt before. This shirt, I I think it was in season one, and I want to say it was in the dating episode. Um, in no, Sheila, was, he loves me. That was the one that no, no, that was the one that Gus wore it. But I don't Somebody think it was that wore shirt. it. I don't, think I don't it was know. That shirt. I believe that this shirt has been seen before. So, if anyone out there can confirm that, bring it on. Hmm. I don't think I definitely don't remember it being worn by Henry. I, I don't like know. I don't remember it was worn by somebody. All I know is Sean leaves. He gets mad because his dad tells him, you need to think outside the case. Or what What did he say to him? How did he put it? You need to think outside the case or outside the... I, I don't remember the exact wording, but I, I know it's something to be about. like, think from outside. So Sean runs off. He's like, I can't believe I came over here. He runs out and then he comes back in the door. And says, I need you to know that a little girl outside started crying when she saw this shirt. <laughs> it's such a great way to end it's that scene. So mm. bad. Because it just means that, like, Sean got outside, and even though he was frustrated, he still just wanted to make a joke about the shirt. Mm-hmm. We. <laughs> Then we go back to the psych office for a minute. It's a brief scene, but it's at 27 minutes, 33 seconds. Sean has made a full replica of the classroom where the spitball incident occurred. Full on, he's got pipe cleaners shaped as people sitting in the desks. Mm-hmm. He's got lockers. Everything is painted accordingly. It's a beautiful little replica yeah. of the classroom. So cute. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, he, and then he, although I do question why he needed it, if he could remember it all that clearly, but he wasn't sitting, he wasn't looking behind him, so he wanted to see everything from behind him mm-hmm. too. Yeah, but we, I don't think uh, we really get much from this. Like we, we don't we just get further theory. clarification of the second spitter that that there no, was no, a second. No. The clarification came when he said that ever that they had just all people had switched seats that day. Yeah, they just had new seats assigned, so he was going over it in his mind the new seats. Mm, yeah, where everybody so, switched. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, but it was right. a very short scene. I just it stuck out to me that he like took the time to make a replica of the classroom from that many years ago. It was yeah. bothering him that badly. He had to make a replica. 
And it was a good replica. Well, the next we're at the police station, and they're trying to get the chief on board because they think it's an open and shut case of just an overdose. And Sean, he manages to convince them of something when he pulls out the tapes that they have that they were kind of reviewing, and he stops him at certain points, and he points out that all the horses slowed down, and then he points out that uh, it looks like Juan got hit in the neck with something, and Mm -hmm. he believes that it was intended for the horses, not for him. Like, he thinks it was an accident. And then right when, like, the chief wants evidence, and he notices something in that moment, which is kind of cool, he notices that the announcer was surprised when the horse didn't slow down. Mm-hmm. He like he was in mid he was like saying like babyface assassin is slowing speeding up. He's he's speeding up around the side of it. Like he was shocked that the the horse was speeding up. Mm-hmm. Um which is kind of weird because you never know what's going to happen. You shouldn't be shocked. You should be right. expecting to to figure it out as it goes. And uh that got them all on board. They're all interested now and they 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 look into it more. I like that he actually said, wait for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In that scene. But... Yep. Yeah. So we're at the track now at 32 minutes, 50 seconds. They are in their awful shirts. Sean and his dad, Henry, both in their awful shirts. And Sean says he's afraid that someone might stare at the pattern and have a seizure. <laughs> Um, but everyone is there. Everyone is there that we know already. The, all the 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 chief, Lassie and Jules, um, Henry's there, obviously, Sean and Gus. And we also see the blonde woman and we see the photographer and we see like everyone's there. This is when Sean starts to piece things together. Yes. Um, so he is able to deduce that all three of the men are in on it. You have the announcer who had the plan, the photographer who had the opportunity, and you have the gambler who is known for making tons of bets around there so he could get away with it. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is the photographer had this like blowgun lens for his camera that he could you know, shoot these darts at the horses as they went by, and he had this nice position right next to the track. And they were setting up these races by drugging the horses and slowing them down so that the long shots would like have more of a chance to win. And they were just mm-hmm. betting lots of money on the long shots. And uh, like on all of them. So they got greedy. They did one more than they should have. You know, as soon as Juan died, they should have like stopped because that's how they got caught. But uh, that's the situation. Mm-hmm. I like how before he summarized it, he rode in on a horse. <laughs> Yeah. And then at one point he was like telling everybody to hold up. He's like, hold your horses. And then one of the other <laughs> jockeys like bends down and gives her horse a little hug. And he's like, Aww. I like the love, but I meant metaphorically. <laughs> and then he says, it's like my dad always says, real men take bubble baths. And a bad gambler never knows when to quit. <laughs> and Henry goes, not bad, kid. Not bad. And then yeah, he gave him props. Guy. Yeah, and then he takes a photo with him and is like, it's all about the memories. And you're going, I love the photo. So, this is so out of character, Henry. Like, I loved that. I loved that ending. That was well, in the photo, it has the jockey above them sitting on the horse. And then Henry's like a classic dad with like a thumbs up in it, smiling. Uh-huh. And then Sean and Gus are like, act casual, where they have like their blue steel <laughs> faces on with sunglasses. And he has those hideous sunglasses on again. I hate them. They were but, very 90s. Yeah. That was very sort of 90s looking. So and then, yep. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You're, you're. It's your, your. your All right. Head. So we're at the very last scene here. Uh, we're at the very end of it. I mean, and we're thirty minutes, thirty-eight minutes in. Jimmy's been released from jail and is leaving, and that's when Sean like kind of nudges Gus to stand up to him about the bullying. Gus starts, and Jimmy kind of cuts him off, and he's like, "You know what? I've been thinking about that, and I apologize. I'm sorry. I was kind of bad to you guys. I did lots of stuff." That that's my bad. Sean also, you know, gets kind of nudged into admitting that he told on Jimmy and he was the one responsible for getting kicked out of school and getting his life ruined and all that stuff. And that's when Jimmy comes out and says, 
my life was not ruined. <laughs> they sent me off to live with my dad in Maui. I got to do whatever I wanted, and my life was amazing. No hard feelings. They get their nice little clean break. No regrets. They're all good. The boss doesn't have to be afraid anymore. <laughs> right. But that leads who was the second spitter. Uh-huh. Do you notice how loud Gus was doing like the nose thing and everything? Oh, here. He... yeah, yeah. No, there was build up to it because what happened was um, they walked away after Jimmy left and they're like over looking at the beach. And Gus is like, well, it's not quite over yet. At least there's still one thing we don't know. Who was the second spitter, Sean? Who's the second spitter, Sean? And then he's like, Sean's slowly putting it together, and Gus is just sitting there, like, stretching, and he had his arms out, like, Superman style. Like, he's all tough guy. He's all, like, swagger. And, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. I think he good. loved it that Sean he couldn't figure him. it out. Oh, all 100%. of that time. He was basking Sean didn't in figure it. it out. He loved it that he fooled him. It was good. And then, then, um, Sean says, uh, they, I don't know. They got mad because they were talking about nicknames from when they were a kid, and that Sean, that that Gus knew Big that Head Sean Burton. started the the name. They uh, called him Big, Big Head, Head Burton, Burton, and Gus and does not like it. No, and and then he says, uh, Sean says, "I'm going to go buy you an ice cream, and we're going to discuss some new, fresh to death nicknames." Yep. And then, he then comes you up look with- down, and he's getting his money out of the ruse that he's wearing. He's mm-hmm. still wearing kangaroos. And it was... came up with a big billowing bear Burton, or like the the billowing uh-huh. bear Burton. Yep. <laughs> Some weird name. Yep. But um, so... we did also get like a, a meta flashback scene with young Gus and old Gus. Oh, which yes. Which was, you know, kind of a funny thing too. Yeah. Seeing them next to each other like that. And they high fived each other. They, yeah. They, the Gusses, they high fived each other. Mm-hmm. What did you think of this episode, Matt? How many pineapples? I, I usually go it. first, so I'm going to let you go first this time. I enjoyed it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I liked it. I think I'm going to have to go with three pineapples, though. Um, okay. Just because, you know, again, keeping the, the episodes clear, this is not one that I, like, think back to, and I'm like, oh, that's my favorite episode. I love that one. It's not like, you know, Earth to Starbucks that I remember, or, like, last episode, uh, episode four. With zero to sixty and or zero to murder in sixty seconds, it, it's not quite on that level. But there's lots of funny jokes in here. There's there's lots of good like friend scenes in here. So I uh, I enjoyed it. And even though I, I noticed that we also really didn't get that much last year in Jules, um, as like solo scenes with them, mm-hmm. they they had some like side scenes that were very short. But it still felt like they were there, and we got a few little tidbits about them. Juliet and yeah, her dating this, history uh, last yeah. year with the horse. So it was nice. It was a heavy Sean Gus Henry episode. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the case I didn't think was super anything like super out of the normal or uninteresting or extra interesting. It was just kind mm. of like a, a three pineapple thing for me. What about you? Oddly enough, I'm going to agree with you. What? I'm gonna go with three. I know I'm gonna go with three pineapples too. This is one of those episodes that I was sort of on the fence of three or four, and I say three or four because, and probably if we had half pineapples, I would do a three and a half because I liked the episode overall. I really liked the flashbacks in this one. We got a lot of flashbacks. I love how they blended the old with the new, and you know with the with with. The two Shans. And I really enjoyed that part of this. That whole, like, the the mystery. It was like a second case mm-hmm. in here of who, who shot the spitball, you know? Like, for me, that was an enjoyable part of the episode. So I really enjoy this episode. But I would say the reason I'm going with three is because I didn't feel like it was an incredibly strong character building or incredibly strong mystery like the main mystery of it the main case so because of that i had to go with three but i really like this episode i i will never just like not watch it i wouldn't skip it intentionally i just like it i think it's a good episode it holds up so i completely agree yeah Yeah. it was just a nice episode nice like i could put it on and listen to it and have a good time yeah so absolutely did you have an I am moment? I 
I don't think I had one this episode. Nothing really stood out as an all yeah moment. Yeah. I liked I liked when Henry made Sean wear the shirt. I thought it was funny. <sighs> For me, that that's a little bit weaker. I, I don't know if I'd go. Well, there weren't a... a ton of mess of of yeah. moments to choose from. Well, here. we don't have to have one. Well, it that doesn't have to be. Me. Just has to be if it I... moves you. Did you have a come on sign? I kind of did. It's a little bit of a weaker one, but it, it was a, a, it was a genuine moment when they opened up the door and we saw Jimmy expecting something else, and it was like a you know a shorter, yeah. smaller guy, not not really a guy that you would be afraid of. So that okay. was my uh, come on, son. Did you get one? I didn't. Okay. So, yeah. Not we don't always get them. No. Uh, what about wait for it? Well, you might have the same wait for it moment, but it was at 40 minutes and 15 seconds when Sean finally figures out that Gus was the second spitter. A hundred percent. Of course. It was like, it's about time, Sean. I mean, I (sighs) might even argue that that could be a come on, son, or an all. Yeah, that could, there's several of those that that could be. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, the wait for it aspect is finding out who the second spitter is. Right. The come on, son, is that Sean couldn't figure it out. The all yeah could be that Gus, you know, worked one over on Sean. So yeah. I would argue that that one could be for any of them based on mm-hmm. you know, what part impressed you the most. Yeah, I I I loved that about this this episode. That was my favorite aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh... Um, Henry lessons. I yeah. I don't really think I got one. I mean, this one I felt like he was just kind of a doing his own thing the whole time. Like, he was more no. focused on the gambling, and I don't know, he kind of helped in that one scene, but... Yeah, he I said, broaden your vision, look on the outskirts of the case. What does that mean? Oh, what does that mean, really? So I think it was really mm. fitting for this case, actually, because what happened happened on the outskirts, on the outskirts of, the, of the track. It was mm. right there. It's where the photographer was standing. So I thought it was like, it was good wording. They chose very good words for it. So I guess, yeah, and I guess in this case, you're not focusing too much on Juan since he wasn't actually the target. You're looking at more of like what else is going on around. Right. Him. Look at everything else. I don't guess. just look at that. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready for our eighties <laughs> guest stars <Yes>. and references? <laughs> oh yes, here we go. <laughs> Matthew's like, I'll oh, be yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll turn off my mic for the next four minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, let's start it off with Crockett and Tubbs from Miami Vice. Miami right. Vice was an hour-long drama. What? As it school me on this. Let me, okay. Let, what did I miss? Okay, so Miami Vice was an hour-long drama that uh, was on from 1984 to 1990. So pretty long-running show. This show inspired a whole realm of fashion. Okay, Mm -hmm. this is when you started seeing men walking around with like shoes with no socks because that was Sonny Crockett was his name. This vice cop who drove a Ferrari, who knows how. Um, And so anyway, he or I think it was a Ferrari. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, please correct me if I'm wrong uh, that I think it was a Ferrari if I'm remembering correctly. But he wore like the linen suits. With the arms pushed up with like a a bright colored t-shirt underneath it. And he was always really tan. Don Johnson played him. Yeah. And then Tubbs was his partner. And they solved all these like, I don't know, um, drug related crimes. Just a bunch of crimes that took place in Miami. So, but they were vice cops. It was like incredibly popular everyone loved miami vice it was yeah. it was big big deal in its time um kangaroos these were tennis shoes that uh were originally debuted in 1979 but were so popular all throughout the 80s i had them your mother had them they were really popular it was like a zipper in the shoe that you can keep money in that's fantastic Everyone loved Ruse. And it had a Velcro closure on top of the... It's it was like so a whole weird. thing. It's such a no, weird thing to be well, a thing. No, but the idea was, like, if you're going running and you need to take money with you, where do you put it? In your pocket. Like, okay, but if your running shorts don't have pockets, you're putting them... Everyone, You have to remember, everyone was also wearing spandex at the time. There's no pockets in spandex, Matt. Okay. There's no pockets right. in spandex, okay? I'm just going to bow out of this one. So you should bow out of this one. It was, like, a great idea. It was a great invention. 
So very popular shoes in the 80s. And oddly enough, you can still buy them today. I looked it up. You can still get kangaroos. So look out. Are they expensive? What's coming for Christmas for you? (laughs) Do they look super old? Like, do they look the same as they did 20 years ago? Yeah, they just look retro. They just look retro. And that's popular. So Are they expensive? I don't remember. I didn't look at how much they cost. I just was like looking, can you still buy them? And yes, you can. I just didn't pay attention to the pricing. So oh. the next one is Howard Hessman. Howard Hessman is the the person who played Barry Sander, the the announcer in this episode. He started his acting career in 1968, but you're going to probably know him best from Soap which aired in the 80s. WKRP in Cincinnati was a big one. He played Dr. Johnny Fever, who was a DJ at a radio station that ran from 1978 to 1982. He was also on One Day at a Time from 82 to 84, and uh, which was a, a great sitcom with Valerie Bertinelli. Oh, my God. Because they have a pouch. <laughs> oh. Did you not get that? That's why they were called kangaroos. Wait a minute. Can I just point out that Matthew has just made the connection between the brand name Kangaroos and the fact that Kangaroos have a pouch? We've been calling it a pocket. I didn't think about it as a pouch. Oh, my God. I love that you just got that. I love that you just got that. Okay. Anyway, back to Howard Hudson. So we're going to let Matthew get past what his laughter here. So, okay. So, so then he went on to start in a oh, show called head of the class that ran from oh, 1986 God. to 1990. That show was really cool. He played a teacher for all these really gifted students. So he's had a really long and very successful career, honestly, for a, a long time. The next reference is The Omen. That was a horror movie in 1976. I've never seen it, so I can't say much about it. The Children of the Corn was also a horror movie in 1984. They have remade this several times, once in 2020 and then once for TV, which I don't know why they didn't just kind of leave it alone. I, I don't know. I remember other people that I know seeing this movie, but I just couldn't do it. I can't do horror movies. Uh, Next reference is Chips. Chips was an hour-long cop drama for motorcycle cops. It ran from 1977 to 1983, starred um, Eric Estrada and Larry Wilcox. And it was later made into a movie in 2017 by Dax Shepard. It was one of his directorial, not really his debut. He had already made Hit and Run, but he did direct this. Michael Peña was in there, too. Michael Peña is awesome. Yes, he was. And then we uh, get a little reference to Footloose here. That was an amazing movie. That was in 1984. Starred Kevin Bacon. Still a classic 80s movie. And everybody was talking about this movie when I was out. And I remember going to the theater with your mom and seeing this movie while our mom and dad saw another movie in another theater. It was very, it was like the first movie like this that we sort of got to see on our own it was a big deal that that movie was a big deal had a great soundtrack footloose by kenny loggins and you know a bunch of other songs um bonnie tyler i need a hero there there were so many good songs on this on this soundtrack um ops were a it was a brand of clothing you can still get it now they still make like bathing suits and things like that um uh, that it was like very surfer looking clothing uh, Mr. Furley, we talked about a little bit. He played the landlord on Three's Company from 19... 19- well, the show ran. He wasn't on it the whole time. Um, the, he was on the later the later years of it. Um, after the original landlords got their own show called The Ropers. Mr. Roper was the first landlord. And then they moved on to Mr. Furley. And Mr. Furley uh, was on the last couple of years. But the show ran from 1976 to 1984. It starred John Ritter, who was amazing. And the physical comedy in that show was great because of him. And Suzanne Summers was also in that show. We also talked about Dr. Pratt already. He played uh, a doctor on ER in 2002. It was Mackay Pfeiffer that played him. Another reference when Sean was trying to convince them that it was poison, they were referencing the band Poison. This was a band uh, that had uh, Brett Michaels as the lead singer. Ricky Rocket, CeCe DeVille were also members of the band. It was founded in 1983. They had hits like Every Rose Has Its Thorn, Something to Believe In, Nothing But a Good Time, and Talk Dirty to Me. Awesome band, by the way. Really, really good music. 
Uh, the which Matthew would probably hate it. I I feel uh, like no, you would no, it's hate not the bad. Metal. It's it's yeah. not bad. No, I love it. It's, that takes me back to the hair band days, and I love that. So then we got a reference also to the IROC Z. This was a really popular Camaro in the eighties. I mean, if you had an IROC Z, it was like the coolest thing ever. Okay, so that car debuted in nineteen seventy three, the year I was born, Matt way back and <laughs> and was just really really popular through the 80s uh, we also referenced z cavariccis that was a famous designer jeans that were really also popular in the 80s and 90s they sort of had a high waist and like snaps or buttons and then they would fold over into these little v's at the waist super cute pants always pleated i loved them uh, Teen Wolf was another reference here. That was a movie from 1985 starring Michael J. Fox. And there was a second one, actually, that starred Jason Bateman in 1987, Teen Wolf 2. Teen Wolf 2. I think Jason Bateman, like, kind of after that, his career didn't do so well for a little while, but. There's the third one. Well, there's a TV series from 2011 of Teen Wolf, and I think they just needed to leave it alone. I actually, I remember I watched it a while back. Like, I, I watched it when I was, you know, when it was on at the time. I liked it. I enjoyed it, at least for the first, like, two seasons, I think. Um, a huge part of that was Dylan O'Brien's character, who I'm, I'm really trying to remember. He had a weird name, but uh, his character was really funny. So but, I'll be uh, honest. I also with... loved the like super. I like the I like the supernatural stuff, like the the zombies, okay, but if you, vampires, if... all that stuff. Uh, okay, I get where you're coming from, and maybe if I had watched the series and never seen the movie, I would feel like that. Mm. But this movie was like just kind of ridiculous. I, I it's it wasn't completely different than the old one. Okay, it's not so, even in the same yeah. ballpark. Yeah, it wasn't superhero-y. It wasn't like that back then. It was like he just, it was not great. I, no, no, there's not a fan story. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a fan. It wasn't like what you're, what yeah. I'm sure they would do today with it. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's very different than that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. so the four minutes is over, Matt. All the 80s references have been covered. <laughs> they, they were all on point. They were amazing. <laughs> I'm sure you thought so. Where's the pineapple, Matt? Where was the pineapple? Um, and this one, I believe the only one that was here was the one on the ugly shirt that it, you know, Henry made him wear. Yeah. Kind of just stood out his little pineapple mug on there. Yeah. So yeah, nothing too crazy. Uh, we already discussed the silly nicknames for Gus, uh, Burton Oil Can Guster, as well as Burton the Billowing Bear and Big Head Guster. The last two, I don't think really count as the same thing, but we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't mention them. So, um. They weren't fresh to death. Yeah, not not quite. So, how does this episode hold hold up over time for you? Let me just. So, how does this episode hold up over time? Do you think that it uh, stands up okay? I think the storyline itself does. I think you. It, it's still. I mean, I know there are still tracks and. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. I do think there were a couple of references in this episode that would not be allowed on TV now. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's, you know, there's probably like um, one or two out there that are that are probably not uh, fantastic or public like viewed. Very I don't think well they'd now. be well received now. You know, a couple of the the things, but I think overall, I mean, I don't, I don't think there was anything extremely dated. In fact, it's really surprised me that they had a podcast comment in there. So, yeah, and I mean, I know with you know, it doesn't really count in this you know kind of question the technology mm -hmm. stuff, but there was a lot of old tech in this that like the, the Henry has a DVD player VHS combo box, <laughs> and then if you look at the in the final scene when they're him and Henry are in there at the at the track with the police, you know, spread out kind of like a little sting operation. They're inside like the nice booth or mm -hmm. the nice like skybox thing. And at every table, it's like bolted to the handrails that are next to the tables. They have these little CRT TVs. And I think it's really funny that they have these like big box TVs. They're only like 14 inch screens or something. Like they're little tiny ones that you'd even like. I think we had one before that you put in the car for mm -hmm. like road trips. 
they're like bolted to the handrail. And I thought that was funny that they have like these boxes on like balancing essentially on the handrails all over the place. Um, the cameras yeah. were, you know, older, you know, it, it reminded me, well, it reminded me of like, you used to be able to go into airports when, when you were waiting, you could pay money and they had like this little desk sort of thing with a TV as you know, like if you're in school and the, you had that desk in front of you, there would be a TV in front of you there. And it was a big TV like that, like that big box there. And yeah. all these individual ones lined up. It sort of reminded me of that. Like they were just bulky there. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. yeah, it's um not like a part of the story at all. But it, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot more technology in this one that's kind of dated. So, yeah, should be mentioned. I agree. But I enjoyed the episode. I thought it hold yeah. up pretty well as far as like the mystery goes, the jokes. Um, I thought that all held up fine. Mm -hmm. Um. It's just a good all around episode. Yeah. Just a nice episode. Absolutely. Nothing incredible, nothing horrible. It was just like a good episode. Yeah. I liked it. Our next episode, we will be discussing season two, episode six. Meat is murder, but murder is also murder. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook. Um, the Facebook group is We Know You Know, a podcast about psych. They also have the Psych Fanatics of Facebook group, which we're yeah. active in there too. You can also find us on Instagram at The Psych Podcast. As well as uh, YouTube and Reddit, The Psych Podcast, no spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and The Psych Podcast at gmail.com if you wanted to email in anything in. Um, mm -hmm. Questions, comments uh, about any episodes. Also, future episodes. Are there any mm -hmm. episodes that are not out yet that you're looking forward to for season two? Something that we could, Ooh, yeah. if you have any questions, if there's any favorite episodes, episodes you hate, we can always talk about that stuff at the beginning. Let us know early because we do record mm -hmm. like a week or two early sometimes. So give us a heads up. Yeah, I think this week we're recording episode five right now, but of season two, but we just released episode three. So if you have anything, that's a great point, Matt. If you have questions or anything about a, a future episode in the season, you know, shout at us. Let us know. Anyway, you guys, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great week. Yeah, thanks for listening. Have a good day. Bye.